let's get started. Thank you everybody for being here early on a Saturday morning. Uh, we're uh, we're going to talk about one that I think the coolest we're going to this year, which is uh, the very name that, uh, that we brought in. For those of you guys that uh, aren't are new to us, uh, we're a weekend aircraft flying experience for a nonprofit that's focused on perfect change, home build designs. Uh, I always say the home build that led to space. Uh, we preserve and promote perfect hands airplanes by flying. By bringing them here, we're not a museum. We're, uh, we're not about static displays or you know, putting things behind ropes that people can't, can't walk up to and touch. So uh, we'll get going. Um, this is the back of our, our shirt, our standard shirt. See about some of them here, thank you for wearing them. And it kind of explains what one of our goals is. We have a lot of goals, but one of them is to acquire at least one flying example of every one of Perfect Tan's home built designs that, that we can find as the airplanes he sold plans for. And there are six of those, um, and I'm proud to say today we have several long easies, several very easies. We actually have nine airplanes that have been donated to us that fly. And now we have a baby, and so we're halfway there. Uh, we have a defining project, an unfinished defining project, which we may or may not ever come up with funding to finish. We have a couple of quick easy carcasses that uh, a friend of mine, Tony Walk Warnock, and one of our members is uh, trying to make one good airplane out of. Uh, the holy grail for us is the solitaire. I only know two of which that exist to fly, uh, but Harold Bigford, uh, he, he had the one here in 2019. Uh, and he's, he's one of our members and committed to fly this. They don't have to be our airplanes as long as they're present, okay? But ultimately, we would like to have that because it's easier for us to demand. So, um, 2019 was a big, big year for us. Um, that's, the, that's the year that we were asked by EAA to help the purpose coming. They said, hey, can you get some airplanes together? I said, I got a better idea than that. I said, I'd like to fly in the air show. And that kind of proof of concept in the whole idea of having all six airplanes and, and flying them in front of the public. We didn't fly a solitary that year because Harold didn't have it as a solitary. Um, we had every other model of flying in front of the public that day in the air display. And from what I've been looking at, the first time that's ever happened uh, in the past, Bert had flown all those airplanes here and never flying at the same time. So, it can be done, and when you do that stuff, you have to get up really, really early uh, and taxi out, and uh, this is just some cool shots from that year. The big in, in these pictures belong to Charlie Spinelli, um, and I gotta tell you, it was so cool to join up this formation, you know, right next to a big and catbird and all that stuff. So that's kind of where we're headed with this thing. Uh, Bert came by that day, and he, he had a really good time as Charlie's being there. Uh, Charlie's was the only flying big at the time that we know. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, he donated it to the Pima Air Museum. Um, it was a beautiful airplane, but he was determined to uh, donate it. It's his airplane, he can do whatever he wants. Uh, I think he donated to us, but he felt the airplane, uh, as old as it was, he would be uh, preserved in a static, static situation. So, um, and then in 2019, something really miraculous happened. Um, a, a gentleman walked up to me here and said, uh, I have a big, are you guys interested in it? I said, of course, tell me about it. And so Scott James came up to me and told me about the students they had that didn't fly and never flown, and they were never going to do anything with it. So he and his uh, buddy Dave Eckenberger that, that owned it, um, donated to us. He sent me some pictures. At first I was like, okay, looks like a big, I don't know, didn't see much about it. Uh, it came with a bunch of folklore about its history. We didn't really have much data. Uh, all we knew, according to Scott, was that it never flown. And at one time, it was all together and had an engine and all that stuff, but it never flew. We didn't know why. And so we went to Little Rock, and uh, like an episode in storage wars, uh, Scott takes us to this storage unit the south side of Little Rock, and he rolls up the door, and there's a big we're like, wow. And we just covered it with dust. It's been sitting there for a long time. And we kind of walked around it and said, cool. And the paperwork had already been done and everything. And as it sat there and didn't have an engine, uh, that's what the firewall looked like. All of the instruments had been robbed out of the panel. Um, 
but most of the airplane was structured in this day. So we said, wow, dude, let's look it up. So we did. We went back to Dave's house, and they had this nice little stand for the wings. We threw them all on the Robert's truck and uh, headed back to Covington, Tennessee. When we got to Covington, I was so excited about it. I wanted to see what this airplane looked like put together. The first thing I did, even before it was off the trailer, I put those two, got rid of all the dust. And then we stabbed the wings on with some temporary bolts. And we went, wow, that's a good looking airplane. I mean, it really a good looking airplane. And we were really excited to have it. Um, and, and one of the questions we got all week long is people walk up and say, I didn't know they had no wings. But why does this one have no wings? The early ones had no wings. Um, and so we had this really cool dig. This is all the guys down there. It's a uh, place happy to see this. So, as a nonprofit, though, as small as we are, we didn't have money to, to get this project going. But we had a big account. You know, okay, with no engine, no instruments, and no history, and no airworthiness certificate because it had never flown. So we started digging around, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't know who the original builder was until probably the first week of June because we were getting ready for the DAR to come up and get the airway certificate for it. And I was digging through some other boxes that I found that I may have been through and didn't notice. And I found some documents that had some names on it. And the name was Harry Patterson, okay? Now I've been trying to find the history of this airplane since we got it. And we have a really good builder's walk out of the old photographs, remember photographs, okay? And in there, there was this one photograph of an engine mount bolted to a piece of plywood and some addresses. And it's from H.G. Patterson, Prescott, Arizona, to somebody in Snowline, Red in the Morning. And so I got led down the rabbit hole. Okay, I thought, okay, some guy named H.G.P. Patterson built this engine mount and it's shipped to these guys in Red in the Morning. So I started scouring the Pacific Northwest contact the EAA chapters and airports. Did anybody know who Snowline was that had this big, right? Man, like, I was way off the trail, okay? But Builder's Law had pictures of this guy building the bigot. And lots of good detailed pictures, which made us feel better. Because we expect the airplane to crawl the load here. If you get an old wooden airplane, okay? You want to make sure the glue joints are good, you know? How do you tell that stuff? Well, you get some more on the wood, you know? We're composite guys, and get guys, and RFE, we do composite stuff. And I was standing there one day in the shop and looking at the lady by before we kind of got started with the engine and, and that really kicked off the process. And I, I turned around to Harris and I said, um, hey, wait a minute, this thing is wood. Do we need to have wood in this shop? And he said, no. <laughs> so we had to kind of change the way we do things. But the pictures of the builder box really showed a lot of detail and, and a lot of good work. So we, we used these a lot and, and we kept wondering, well, who is that guy? Okay. So went through all of these, here's pictures of him building the metal wings and everything. Really cool shots. But we still didn't know who that guy was. There was nothing in these pictures that led us to anything except that one shot with that one address on it. You know, red and white. Okay. The way you see Lady Bai sitting out there today is the way Harry Patterson finished it. That's his paint job out there. We didn't paint it. Um, he hung the engine on it. He had an IO 320. And we found out later he actually ran it. So he basically finished the airplane but never flew it. We were wondering why. So digging through those boxes in the first week of June, I found this. I was like, wow, where did this come from? I've never seen this before. It was an ad. It was an ad for Lady Bob. When you zoom in on it, he advertised it as a 1998 Rutan Grade baby. He was selling it for $23.5. This cracks me up. It's total time zero, times this micro, and we'll do it for none. <laughs> okay. And it was even a bill of sale. It's like, wow. So now we do the very average. So I found those guys. This is what I call protective work. If you've got an airplane you messed up registration, you start, start digging backwards on who the previous owners were. So 
I found Tim Thomas to talk to him. And then, of course, Tim Thomas saw the airplane to stop James and Taylor. So, and then Tim Thomas told me the story that he bought the airplane from Harry Barris. And Harry Barris actually lived in Prescott, Arizona. Okay? So, I don't know why Harry shipped an engine mount to somebody in Redden, Oregon, but you know, now we know that it was impressive. So we started digging through that and doing a bunch of detective work. And I eventually got a hold of his son. But Lady Vi at that point, or previously, went into storage there in Covington, Tennessee. So I got a hold of Rob Patterson and his son. He was thrilled to know that the airplane flew that. I actually got his name and number, and then the day we did the first flight, I called him. And he, he was really, really thrilled. Uh, he explained to me a little bit more about his dad. His dad, Gary Patterson, um, was uh, joined the Royal Canadian Air Force uh, during World War II, and he was underage. And they found out about him in Chicago. A year later, when he turned to the right age, I guess 18 or something, he got back and he went through pilot training. Uh, and then when they finished, the war was ending. And they said, we got nothing for you guys to fly. So him and his buddy said, well, we can go through all this and not fly. So he became a B-24 turret gunner, a uh, ball turret gunner, and went to India and a lot of stuff before it ended. And he came back, and then he, he came to the United States, and he was a, one of the guys that founded the Plains of Fame Museum. He was really big in the Plains of Fame. So apparently here, it goes way back, and they lived in California. Uh, he built a bunch of airplanes, and he was always a craftsman. And one of the things that, we, that struck us about this airplane was it's really well built, and some of the things that Harry did, we said, this guy knew how to build airplanes. He knew airplanes. We were at a point in some down here that really showed that to us. So we finally, just a month ago, basically, figured out who this guy was. And that gave us a lot more confidence in the airplane, and it really kind of fills in a bunch of holes in the story. So. Yes, but have you figured out who Lady Vi is yet? Let's get that. So Lady Vi, his wife's name was Vivian, okay? And his son, Rob, flew a B-51 in the Marine Air Races named Lady Joe. So I don't know if next year maybe he was inspired by Lady Joe and called this one Lady Vi. The sad thing is, Harry died in 2020. His wife died like nine months later. And had we known who he was, we had a chance to talk. But we didn't find that book yet. So that breaks my heart. Um, but it really, it, 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 as, as, you, as you talk to me out here, one of the things I always emphasize is what we do is preserve the number of and home designs. But those are just airplanes. They're just machines. They're it's meaningless to us without the story of the people that went with us. So this really, really meant a lot to me to figure out finally who Harry Jackson was. We also found out, I talked to Rob Harrison last night, that Harry actually didn't initiate this, this airplane bill. He bought an unfinished thing and, and finished it. But Rob can't remember who actually started. We're trying to figure that out. But he said when they got the airplane, it was just a, just a frame that had not been filed with or whatever. And that makes sense when you look at the building all the pictures. There's no picture of him laying down the first piece of file that he so he bought this unfinished thing that he was letting the airplane finish, and he finished it out. So there's more to this story that we get to find out. So um, Lady Vi sat around for a while, because um, when like I said we didn't have money, I was trying to come up with some funding to get the project going, especially when I found out that Charlie had donated his ticket, and now there are no flying tickets. Okay? And then in 2020, uh, Tony Warnock down in the Mobile, Alabama, the guy doing her quick, he calls me up and says, I have a friend of mine that's building an RV. He bought an IO360 on a trailer plane, um, but he didn't know it was a Continental 360. So he's got this six-cylinder Continental IO360 off the back of the Skymaster, and, and uh, he said, you just got another guy. He, just, he bought it, and he put it up on the pallet rack and said, oh, well, no, I screwed up. And I convinced him to donate with you guys for the meeting, and yeah. And we were really excited because I like the IL 360 Continental. It's a very smooth running motor, it's 210 horsepower. And I rented a truck and drove down to Mobile, picked it up, we dragged it back to Covington, and we went to the barrel of the truck with a crane scale on it, and I just about, my heart sank. This is like a 420 pound motor. It's a big motor, and it's heavy. And we said, well, we, we can't, there's no way. There's no way that's falling back on the 
So one of the principles that I have for our is we don't sell things that are donated to us. Like if a donor gives an airplane and we told them we want to use it to preserve and promote for a can of stuff, is it, I think it's disingenuous to turn around and sell it. A lot of nonprofits see donations just as a, 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 a money stream. I don't look at it that way, but the engine, that's a little different. So we actually put it on barn farmers. We got 9,500 bucks from the engine. It had log books, everything. Guy bought it, um, so was thrilled to have it. And all of a sudden, our AP had $9,500. I was like, cool. We've never had $9,500 before. And I said, wait a minute. This money is going to stay with the lady bucket. We're not spending it on anything else. So now we had some money, and I thought, well, Let's take this money and, and apply it towards the engine we want. We wanted an 0320 and 0360 on And just kicking around, you know, trying to find a motor, um, it, it really didn't take any action on it. And then in December, Alan applied to one of our members. He has an aero canard. He called me up and said, I'm going to put a 540 in my aero canard because you guys use my IO 360. Well, IO360 is a big angle valve. IO360 is a big motor for a big one, but I thought, yeah, that might work. So he donated his IO360, and it was the easiest engine conversion I've ever done because his aero convert was in the jet guy shop, and the big one was in another day in the jet guy shop. And we pulled the IO360 off the aero convert and pushed the engine hoist over to the big end, and we just rolled it off. How cool was that? And that's the last time anything fit. <laughs> but the, the first thing we did is when we yanked it off the aero canard, as you see, seems we hung it on a crane scale. Because I was already snaked at once by that Continental 360 and weighed 312 pounds. And I did the math in my head real quick and I said, I think this will work. Uh, like I said, it's a huge motor for a Viggen, but I, I think it will work. So when we hung it up against the back of the Viggen, everything looked, we were all really excited. And then we realized, it really doesn't fit because the engine, the oil uh, sump, you see the oil sump down here, it was hitting the, the diagonal tubes on the engine mount. And I had gone through all that trouble to, to paint that engine mount. By golly, we're going to use it right. Because let me tell you something that engine mount, the bolts, upper bolts there behind the fuel tank, and you got to be, a, if you're claustrophobic, this is not going to work. And I am. You got to be a tunnel rack to get underneath that fuel tank to reach up back there where you can't see an old wrench on that engine mount bolt. And I wasn't going to do that again. Okay. So they were talking about rebuilding the uh, the engine mount to uh, to make the engine fit. I said, stop. Let's do something else. As you can see, the engine bolted on. Well, actually, what happened was we found another engine mount. I think it's the one that was on that plywood. And we and I did bolt this one on, and everything fit except the oil sum still was, was interfering. So, took that one off again and painted it. This is some volunteers that were there. Evan and Mary came down and used the car flight training with us. And then rained one day, I said, you guys want to work on big And they did it. There were a lot of volunteers that uh, got all of this. So, then, in order to get that into the fit, so we did this thing called the sump back to me. Um, Mike only makes several different versions of sumps. The one you saw, they call the horizontal sump. It's very wide and flat, and it was interfering with the engine mount. Um, I had this thing, which is called the vertical sump, because it's deeper. Um, and you see all that intake tube? Everybody knows that intake stuff in the library goes through the oil, and it gets the air hot and all that stuff. And I had this idea that we could put that sump on there because it would fit on the engine mount, but I didn't like the idea of, of Never like the idea of all your intake air going through hot oil. Uh, and I said, wait a minute, I got an idea. Let's make a cold air induction. And uh, I had one kicking around in my head for a while, and I said, I'll do this, because I didn't want to take that engine mount off again. So I took a very expensive airplane part and tried to destroy it. And I'm telling you, that, that casting that makes up those intake tubes is massive. I bet it's three that I used a fine tool, I used a sawzall, I used a hammer, I used a milling machine. I virtually tried to destroy the sun. Um, and then we welded it all back up. And uh, it's, things started to look really, really good. Made some plates there to hold the body. Nobody in Jet Guys or RFD is really good welders. 
So I took it down to Houston. My buddy John Klein was about 85 years old. He didn't look anything. He welded it all up, and it came out beautifully. Except that when I got it back to Covington and I stuck it on the pop loader, it didn't fit. Well, anybody here well? Okay, you know why, right? I called John back in a panic, and he goes, well, of course it doesn't fit. You didn't give it to me on the jig, you know? I said, oh, man, I should have molded that to a metal plate or something. I said, well, what do I do? He says, well, you got any way to eat it? I said, yeah, I think so. But I looked across the room here. Was it just one bay that's open and outside, and there's a gas grill sitting right there? I said, I think so. How hot do you need it? It was 450. I said, I might be able to do that. And it just barely fit inside the gas grill. So we threw the gas grill, cranked it up, kept shooting with my arc gun, got it about 450. Uh, Bob was there, he was helping me in a double while other than this. We yanked it out of the gas grill, run it over the airplane, kind of look at it, run it over to a hydraulic press, and we squeeze it this way, and squeeze it that way. I actually got a small jack and stuck inside and squeezed it out. And it took, what, four, five, six times to do that? And all of a sudden it went thunk right on the engine. I went deep right there, it's like cool. And we did. We both got on there and it worked out really good. The way the throttle body hangs below it lends itself real well to the uh, to the cold air induction. And if, you're, if you want to save weight your engine, check this out. We save almost seven pounds. That's a lot of weight. So now the oil slump is just an oil pan, and then we have to figure out how to feed air to the motor. So we took the original uh, intake tubes, which are steel, started cutting them up, changing the orientation of the bins, and then I took a big block of loose styrofoam, carved it to a pleasant shape. Uh, this is just T Larson's, that looks about right in here. Made the little slip joints on there, put it all together, carved it up. When I was done with all that, when the carving cured, I threw it in a bucket of gasoline and went to lunch. When I came back, the blue foam was gone, and I had a plum. And it came out gorgeous. So, and it works really, really well. All the EGTs in this airplane were in about 30 to 50 degrees. That means the nozzle are pretty well matched, and it's getting huge amounts of air. So, uh, the reason there's carbon up the tube like that is because I'm a horrible welder and I welded up those bins. And I said, uh, let me cover this up with carbon so maybe it'll keep my porous belt from leaking. So, and it looks really cool. So, that's the uh, cold air reduction part of the story. Um, you, you can see it go back to the airplane, it's all visible through that great big air exhaust. You saw the firewall, we have to put everything back on there. Um, and when you deal with somebody else's project, you want to have the confidence that the guy did it right, but how do you know? So while I was underneath that, that fuel tank, I looked up and I saw this line, and I went, wait a minute, that's the main fuel line from the tank to the fitting on the firewall, and realized that Whoever did that didn't realize it. They made a P-trap. That bed down there was on the bottom. That would have held hard to debris. So we replaced that. But then cool things started happening because I saw a picture of the Marion and that boy. Volunteers were coming out wanting to help, wanting to help. And like I said, we had some money, but I was trying to conserve that as much as I could because we had expenses. There were things we needed to buy. I said, this is the time for RAP to start reaching out to all of the vendors and companies that we could talk to and say, hey, can you help us out? Can you help us out? That starter, alternator, regulator, all that stuff was donated by ABC Specialties. Uh, I've known Nate for a long time, his dad, Bill Banker, is a star of the company, he's a good friend of mine, and I was thrilled when he literally donated that stuff. Uh, they've always helped us out with good discounts when I was talking about this. And I told him it was for Biggin, and he got to find Mike Nolan's bill Biggin. He said, I, I got something for you. He just sent it to us, didn't charge us a thing. Um, a lot, same thing happened with the Dr. Dave uh, You remember the picture of the panel? Originally, we were going to plug round dials back in there because one of the things that's been happening is that everybody rips their old panels out and puts glass in there. They call us up and go, hey, you're, you're a nonprofit. Can I donate my round dials to you? And I don't say no. Yeah, sure. So we're now become like the depository of round dials. We got boxes of them. So it would have been easy to plug round dials back in. Um, but then something else happened that, that changed our opinion. You see that switch panel? This one right here. When I mentioned before that Harry Patterson knew how to build airplanes, 
We saw that switch panel and we went, wow, that's one of the original, actually in the panel, that's the only original thing that he left besides the reflex indicator. Um, that is so well done. It hinges, it, you know, it hinges out, you work on the switches in the back. We decided to keep it because he'd done such a great job and we're basically lazy and we don't have to redo it. But it's just this super well done. So we like, man, this guy's really, really good. Uh, and then Rick Hall called me up and said, I got a friend that's going to rip the panel out of his lands here, put new stuff in it. Do you guys want this old GRP stuff? We said, sure, because we don't say no. And so we got three GRP, Ethan Springs, the EIS, and a bunch of other stuff that went with it. And uh, we said, why don't we put that in there? Save a bunch of weight um, and make it look more modern. So um, Curtis Porter, where's Curtis, man? Curtis, who lives in Salt Lake City, you were Delta, right? Yeah. Worked for Delta, commute from Salt Lake City to Memphis on his own dime, rent his own car, get his own hotel room, and did all the wiring for those screens, which is good, because if I did it, none of that stuff would work, okay? And it all worked. Did the radios, um, we had a transponder, we, we uh, got the Edmo gave us a deal on that flatline 760 radio. We had that intercom donated to us, and, and Curtis did all the wire, and, and we're extremely grateful. Let me tell you something, this airplane's not easy to work on. It looks real spacious, but that's Robert in there back working on something. If you're working in the back seat of the big, there are no seats in this thing. You sit on a bucket. <laughs> and, and you gotta crawl around and do things. That's, that's, that's Bob Steve right there. And somebody's got to call underneath that fuel tank and put those ignitions in. And like I said, I'm claustrophobic. But it all started coming together. Bob did the panels, he cut the metal, uh, mounted all the instruments, turned the all the wiring, and started to come together. But pay attention to the dates as I throw these up there. March 29th, okay? This is July. The airplane wasn't even out, it, it wasn't even out of the idiotic bay at that point. So, we had a lot of work left to do. The IO 360 didn't fit underneath the 320 pounds, obviously, so I used my finger tool, fine tool, and I whacked it all with the blisters off. And we're going to make new counts. I mean, we all have home builders, that's not that hard, right? Except that we were out of here a thing long. And so was aircraft spruce. And so we got to do it out of the starter form, which we've done before. We've got plenty of stuff laying around for week before jobs. It's not as easy to carve as your thing, but it gets the job done. So we did all that, and uh, that's actually plaster of Paris. It's one of my techniques. I'll put a plaster or, or sheetrock mud, actually, and just fill all those pores. It makes it much better, much better. And put a couple flies of bit on it. Um, the configuration of the engine is a little different than what, what the area had. We didn't know where his oil cooler went, so we put a big scoop on the side for the oil cooler. Uh, on this side, there was this really lovely scoop that uh, we're not sure what it did. We whacked that off, and if you look on the right side, maybe you'll see something up here. This great big old intake scoop for the uh, air filter. Uh, but you just got to put this out to get it done. This is Fred Cabello, Robert, working on the bathroom. That was June 10th. Okay? There's Bob working on the bathroom. And anybody that came by, this guy, uh, Tom, Tommy Tillman, wore a lot of berries, he brought from our shop, and he came in and saw the day and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm working on baby Collins today. He goes, can I help? I said, sure. I handed him a block of sandpaper. I said, get after it. And, and everybody pitched in. Like I said, this is volunteers with donations made this happen. The guy I like here, that's Alan White, the guy that donated the engine. John Albright, the guy with the jet down there. They're, they're, they're just... Everybody help, because everybody wants to see this airplane get it to Oshkosh. That's the first quarter climb on the Cowlings. And look at the date, July 15th. Okay? That's that little ugly intake. Um, we won't talk about that much. Um, I wanted to put an intake on the bottom of the airplane to feed the carburetor or the throttle body and a, and a little cooler. But it's all closed out, it's finished. Nobody wanted to cut a hold of the airframe. And I didn't know where we could get through. I was gonna put like a small thing in one scoop up there. That's where the high pressure is anyways, and feed all that stuff. But we just didn't, didn't look at the planes as one thing, then cut a hold of the bottom airplane as another. 
Earlier this year, we had another vacant. And what people may not realize is there's four vacants in Covington, Tennessee. Lady Bob, Robert Harris has two that he's picked up along the way that have flown before, but he's never had time for the store. And earlier this year, we had another one donated to us that we call Woody. It's an unfinished thing, and probably the mistake that, that Eric Addison got his it was found hanging from the ceiling of the guy's shop in Pennsylvania. And some friends, Tom Wright, Lindsey Briggs, volunteered to get it to us. And the cool thing about it is you can just see through it. You can just look up, see all this stuff. Whenever we had an issue with the landing gear that we had, we brought over to Woody and go, oh, that's how that works. Um, but now I can see through the beaver tail where I can make that penetration of duct that air. So we'll do that in the future. But to get the air to the throttle body, what we did is we just stuck that big scoop on the side. And then just like before, we piped up you know, a, a rod of stone and made a, made a duct up to it. And uh, kind of came out looking like that. So everything just kind of came together. Landing gear, uh, Biggins have always had a reputation for interesting landing gear. Let me put it this way. Burt's original design had cables ranging along the gear. Mike Melville came along and designed a mechanical system that worked a whole lot better. Uh, Rob Smith, you, had, you said you didn't have too much trouble with yours. We were very, very hopeful since the airplane was new that our gear would be trouble free because everything's new, right? What could go wrong? Well, that's the motor for the gear. It's a 1963 Ford window motor. That's probably new. I don't know. It's got out of the wrecked yard somewhere. Uh, we have no history on the motor. And the gear took forever to go up and down. I ran the, uh, the, the part number on the internet and came up like a Thunderbird car for me. The guy made a comment. He said, that motor needs a fat 12 volts. And the way the gear cycled, he said, and that motor is struggling to get that gear up on when we're on the jacks. This is the mechanism that actually rotates the lane in here. Uh, that motor spins the gear in a little homemade gearbox that just spins those torque tubes. And that mechanism is really no different than what the nose gear retraction system is on a lot easier areas of the manual ones. It's a worm gear and a Boston gear that rotates and there's a rod in that pushes the gear over the center. So kind of complicated, a lot of moving parts, a lot of potential failure points. And let's see if I can get this is the gear cycling. And it takes 27 seconds for that gear to come up. The nose gear comes up easy. And there are two separate systems. Each, the nose gear and the main gear have their own motor. The nose gear is almost trouble free. It goes up really fast, and then that gear gets about right there and starts slowing down. And on the jacks, it runs fine, but in here, on our first retraction test, it got to right almost short of being in the well, and the circuit breaker popped out. Like, wow. So we tried to get the speed down and do it again, and we didn't want to overheat the motor. But after two attempts to retract the gear, we said, okay, let's go back down and see what's going on. They go down much easier because gravity helps. So we started looking at things and we realized that there's 18 gauge wiring uh, running from the switches of the instrument panel all the way back to the gear motor. And we said, well, we need to give this thing a better chance to get a fat 12 volts. So they did a test with the battery. They crawled in there and hooked up 12 gauge wire to the motor and then touch the battery in different directions. The gear was up and down really fast. We said, that's the solution right there. Um, then we discovered that when we were tracing the wiring, and the wiring actually goes from the amp from the power source, to say battery to circuit breaker, to bus to circuit breaker. From there to the switch, and then it goes all the way out to the gear well, because your switch is all of those positive. And it goes through up and down micro switches, and then it goes all the way back to the switch, and then it goes to the motor. So there's really about 30 feet of 18 gauge wiring. And somebody did the math and said that motor's only getting about eight volts. So we said, okay. And what we did is we just simply took the wire that went from the switch to the motor and routed it into a relay and ran 12 gauge wire from the power source to the motor. And we re reduced the cycle time by 30%, but it still struggled in flight. So kind of a closely held secret is we flew up here with gear and gear down. And we did all the flying around here with main gear down. It's just not worth the risk at this point because we also noticed there was some gear wear on one of those gears. This is not the place to land gear up, okay? And it doesn't really change the performance of the airplane that much if I go high enough, I still get a decent career speed and all that stuff. So 
Um, here is really a challenge for us because we want to make this airplane reliable so we can fly it everywhere. I've already been asked, can you bring me by here? Can you bring me by here? The airplane's going to get, get this popular and a lot of people want to see it. So we're going to work on that some more. The flight controls are also very interesting. It has two rudders like the long, easy, and very easy, but they don't operate like the long, easy, and very easy. Matter of fact, the rudders, you know, the rudder long, easy, you can step on both of them, do all that stuff. The rudder just, these don't do that. They move in unison, not as much inboard as output. There's a belt length and ratio here. And the rudder pedals do that by, by assessment. So that's a departure from what we're used to in the long, easy world, but that's the way it works. Um, they're all metal. And the wing is metal, and it's full speed aileron. It doesn't have flaps. It doesn't have any, uh, a flapper on. It's just an elevator. That's just the aileron. The elevator's up in the car. But it uses what's called reflex, where the trailing edge of the aileron changes position. It will change from zero to eight degrees trailing edge up, depending on the, the regime of flight. Where Bert told me to use eight degrees trailing edge up for takeoff and climb, and you trim it out as you go faster and it's zero reflexes for high speed. And it pretty much works exactly like that, but rigging this airplane, when we're pulling our hair out trying to figure out how to rig this thing, because none of us have ever rigged anything with reflex. Typically, you rig an airplane, you, know, you set the controls where you are, you tighten all the cables, you set a cable tension, but the way this thing adjusts the trailing edge of the ailerons is by varying the cable tension in the ailerons. There's a stack of pulleys inside the fuselage that are attached to a motor, and the motor just pulls in the stack of pulleys against the spring. So when you do that, you change the tension on the cable, and the flight control position changes. Uh, and the throw of the, of the flight control changes too. We were beating ourselves to death trying to get, you know, we, we made a mistake of putting a smart level on the ailerons. You know, you know what smart levels do? They make you worry about tens of degrees, okay? So we're trying to get minus, minus 10 degrees, plus 11 degrees, and all this reflex stuff. And then late, last week, or the week before, I was reading, reading through some very big newsletters, and where it said, uh, the tolerance of flight control uh, rating is plus or minus three degrees. We could have saved two days. So, but it was really neat to, to understand how that worked. But the problem with rigging the airlines is every time you want to make an adjustment, and anything other than a little rod in that that connects to the aileron, you gotta pull the wing off. There's this big long rod that comes from the belt crank and it's adjustable too. So we were pulling wings on and off, on and off, and then that night I woke up in bed with an idea and I thought, well, why don't we make a fake aileron? And so Bob did and drew it all out. We just took a piece of you know, part of the board and made the silhouette and the, you know, of, of the aileron there and hooked it up. And now we can rip the airplane without even having a wing on it, and it saved a whole lot of time. So, I, I love the shape of that wing. Doesn't that look cool? Yeah. So, it came, finally came time to fly. We got the airplane over when we called the final center day. Um, that was a big day. We moved it out of uh, where it was in, in the main shop here, Robert's, uh, Robert's shop. And he went in there and he sat there a long time. And then we finally got around to start the engine. Um, and and the very first time we tried, it did right off. Well, of course, it came off with one here. It now had a new electronic, you know, with a high speed ignition. Uh, we were apprehensive about the, uh, the induction system, but when I finally hit the start button, it went off. And it's been running that way ever since. It's been a very reliable air. So, yeah, we're not going to watch that whole thing. And then another big day was the first taxi test. And, uh, we were really thrilled to see that happen. We went to go through all the brakes and everything. Let me tell you something, air cleaning that sits for as long as this one is sat. I rebuilt the brake calipers, I rebuilt the master cylinders, and I realized there's probably 30 year old 5606 in those lines. And those lines snake through that whole fuselage. It's all solid, aluminum lines until it gets to the wheel well. And we had to figure out how to flush all that stuff off. But we got it out. We got, we got a service, and then on June 13th, we got our air release certificate. And the thing that I'm most proud of is if you look at Builder, it says routine aircraft flying experience. Uh, they're doing out of the room. 
Um, I didn't build the airplane. Bob didn't build the airplane. Volunteers built this airplane. Volunteers and donations made this happen. And so I felt it was appropriate that instead of having a person thing there, which is what the FAA wants, I talked to the DAR and I said, is there any way you can make that happen? And he said, yeah, I think I can do that. So that to me is huge. Because it shows that as an organization, the Ruth Aircraft Flying Experience made this airplane fly. We finished the project of Harry Cast and started at the end of the time. First flight though, knows the, the, the date on the certificate was certainly to June. I had a job at a job, I had an airline job and weather and things, and we did not actually fly until June 24th. We had to fly out 40 hours, and we did. This is a video of the first flight. I'm looking over my shoulder at the, the chase plane, and I had done all the high-speed taxi tests and all that stuff. And this is the very first takeoff. I'm scared to death. I've never flown a baby before. There were the thousand foot bars. 1250 feet on the first takeoff. That thing goes. Getting used to the roll fields and I finally settled down. It was really, really cool. So there was the first flight, we didn't retract the gear. Um, Learned a lot about the airplane just on that first flight. Uh, that's afterwards, me being pretty happy that I survived. Notice the cowboys aren't even painted. Yeah. That's, that's uh, Robert, myself, and uh, John Aldrin, the chase pilot. We kept flying the airplane. We finally got the first retraction test. Uh, I just like that shot because it looks like a space you, know, you can't see the engine. It's just and uh, half the, for most of the first half of the flight testing, we didn't have gear problems. We noticed that the gear would slow. There's a, there's, if you look inside it, there's a handle right underneath my right thigh. It's, it's really awkward to get to it. But that's, that's the manual extension handle, and, and it's connected to the whole gearbox. So when the motor's spinning it, that handle's spinning. And I was watching it, and I could see it slow down when it got to that point where the gear didn't want to quite get in the well. And I'd reach down and just help it a little bit. And then I noticed that it would start to chatter a little bit. The handle would just kind of shake as it went around through that one spot. And we said, what's going on here? And then on one of the re uh, flights, I noticed that the handle stopped. It was just sitting there chattering. And I reached over and pulled that, the, the circuit breaker, and I said, OK, stop. Let's we'll be talking. We have guys on the ground talking to us. We have a chase plane talking to us on most of the flights. And then at that point, we decided, let's put it back down and get it on the ground and see what's going on. So, and that's when we decided that we're just going to finish the flight testing from here down. So we didn't really get into all the high speed envelope stuff, about 150 knots or so. Um, but it just wasn't worth the risk because we could probably stop and fix it here, but we wouldn't make out. We still had a lot of things to do. So the, uh, uh, oh, this is a, uh, a shot from the full province F-250, which is a speed demon. But it shows you what the acceleration this airplane has with 200 horsepower. It just, in Robert's form, the airplane is just gone. Once it starts to, you know, the roll of the visual roll is a little slow, and once it starts to speed up, it's just gone. So, and even with the gear down, it's a really cool climb. That's another cool shot there. So, that's just me. And so, we did all of our flight testing. We flew our 40th hour, a little over 40 hours on Friday and Saturday. We launched the rocket. Bob Stevens did his long easy chasing all the way up here. It was a little slow to get down. Um, but we got here July 23rd. June 24th, first flight, July 23rd at Oshkosh. If you look on YouTube, there's a bunch of videos of Bert, the interviewing Bert. There's one that's about 15 minutes long. If you just search Bert and Gary David, he talks about his day when he was working for Jim Beattie and everything. And he made a statement, I watched this video in May. I didn't really see what, I didn't have the crystal ball and how things were going. I thought we were going to fly way earlier than we did. But it was pretty obvious that we weren't going to fly probably until June. 
And in that video, Bert says, I flew to Vega the first time in June, and then six weeks later, took it to Oshkosh. And it's on a run the same time. Trust me, it was not by design. But how cool was that? So, as I've mentioned before, RFP is a nonprofit, we're 501 c 3 For us to make an airplane fly was huge. But what made it work is volunteerism and donation. And we are as grassroots as we can be. Nobody in RFP gets paid. I don't get paid, I've never got a dime on this. There is no money to pay. Um, but no, that's one of my principles, is we are a totally nonprofit grassroots organization. But one of the things we did when we saw this coming, we said we don't have the money to even buy the gas or do the 40 hours of flight testing. So I'm really proud of this too. I've never done this before. We did go funny. And the day after we got to Oshkosh, we met our goal. We came up with $5,000 to help fund the flight testing and getting the airplane on Oshkosh. And we sold out the t-shirts, but I don't guess when you get home. Um, <laughs> So I'm really, really proud of that. And if anybody here was the ones that helped us with that, thank you, thank you, thank you. We had a couple of anonymous thousand dollar donations. That's way cool. So that's pretty much it, but I want to throw out one more thing that I think is really fun. I was 12 years old when this happened. Well, I was 12 years old when the baby first came to Oshkosh. I don't want to tell you how long ago that was, but uh, do the math. There was, anybody here remember the cover of Sport Aviation Shop with the first, first wife, Carolyn, standing on the wing? I know you guys do. What, what the rest of you may not understand is, think about it, this is 1972. That caused a huge amount of controversy from what I've told, okay? It was like people were writing the EAA, you know, letters to the editor, oh my God, I can't believe you put, you know, the woman in hot pants on an airplane, what do we become? So just for fun, we love to have fun our ID. 50 years later, 50th anniversary, we do compare to that picture. <laughs> and, and so I'm going to show you, should I send that to Bert or not? Yes! yes. Okay, we're going to send it to Bert. So. Well, I said, that's the story of Lady Bob. It's a vision that was made for a nonprofit volunteer organization. And, and I hope you get to do that again. We have that Defiant Project. This has really inspired me to try and get the funding and the volunteers to get a Defiant Flying because I know every Defiant owner out there. None of them are willing to donate your plan to us yet. Um, but we're really hopeful that we can get the Defiant going and the quickie and then maybe software. And then flying out there all at the same time. How cool would that be? And so we need help, we need volunteers, please, if you're interested, come talk to me or anybody in these black shirts, or these will be long ones. <laughs> but, you know, how about the baby? Thank you for coming, thank you for listening to me, really appreciate your friendship, Thank you.
and, and, um, and he told me some things. He was very adamant about the pitch power relationship. Go look at the airplane. The engine sits really high over the longitudinal axis. And so there are two things I learned about the airplane, especially this one with all of that torque. Um, Bert, Bert was adamant about him knowing that if you push the power forward, the nose comes down dramatically. And if you pull the power back, the nose comes up dramatically. And he said, when you do your high speed taxi test, be real careful because once you get the nose up, if you pull the power off too quickly, your airplane will, will get airborne because it will just pitch up and whatever, with that last little bit of alpha you get, the next thing you know, you're flying. And several builders uh, had that experience and, and wanted to take care of their airplanes. Um, I had done some flight tests on like Osprey Junos or other pylon mounted amphibians, so I had that experience. And the 73 does the same thing. Pretty much the throttle forward of those comes up and it's just thank you in reverse. So I didn't bother to, to tell him I already done all that, so not, not a problem. But uh, he was real, really really important to make sure of the And the other thing that we're still playing with this, but he mentioned to me that it was very poor directional control. In fact, if you look at this picture, he, he told me that the, his airplane had much smaller verticals than the Hugo version he called. And that's pretty obvious right there. Um, but it still lacks a little bit in directional stability. Um, when you step on a rudder, it kind of doesn't, you know, make it. It's about one and a half cycles back, but it's really sluggish in that cycle. Um, but I kept noticing if, if I could run back to the first flight picture, the video, I got a huge amount of right rudder. And first flight, okay, I'm thinking, okay, it's still, it's still not big right, and we got more work to do. But throughout the flight testing, I noticed that every time I moved the bow, the ball was swing one way or the other, the airplane actually rolled and swing. And if you think about it, it doesn't have a P factor, but there's a large amount of gyroscopic precession with that big motor spinning out there with all that 200 horsepower car torque. So when I did push the power up, it causes, causes it to roll off the longitudinal axis. And when you hold it, it gets that, that, that input and all the other axes are affected. So um, it's just the characters of the big and, and not everything in Protestant is like that, but I think it has to do with the, the, the forces involved in such a big boat as well. So, so it's a very rudder airplane to be. I'm, I'm constantly having to, to keep the ball centered. So you wouldn't think that in a push, but in this case it is. So, yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir.
you know, come on, you guys go dig it, it's the 50th anniversary, dust that thing off, bring it to Oshkosh, you know, where are you? Uh, but I haven't seen anybody yet. But there's two, there's a guy with two of them in Atlanta that's trying to make one fly, there's a guy in North Carolina, they're around, but they just need to have somebody to refurbish them. So they've already asked me questions. Hey, you got your flying, what about this or that? And shared information. And so that's that's part of what preservation and preserving bird designs are. I'll give you another example, like, the planters are free. You can get them on Open Easy. You get the turfs disc the, that have all the different plans on there in PDF form. What you can't get is the full size templates, which the video really never had yet. They extrapolate them out of the plan, right? So, but the long easy and very easy, you know, you got your templates to cut the wing foam for and all that stuff and make all those little parts. So, if you get the free plans, what would you do? Well, we're trying to build a template library. So we'll have on the wall all the templates, you're a chapter, whatever, you call me up, hey, can I get a this? And it, it is just a little thing that the RFP do to not cover its costs, and we'll rent you a template for, you know, however long you need it, you know? And that way we can inspire people to keep building, they can get the free plans, and you can get the templates, and then, you know, cut the way you really have to do. So, yeah. What's the free speed? Free speed? Well, I'm cruising around with gear down. We, when we started opening the envelope, we got out to uh, 135, 140, 150 knots at the descent. We didn't go beyond that because that's when the gear stuff started. It should be cruising what, 155? I, I never got about 140. 140, okay. With this big motor, it's probably not going to go much faster than that. I'm guessing 150, maybe. Um, a little extra loop there, maybe a, you know, more Kato's or more efficient clock. That's not the right cost for this airplane either. Um, that came off of an aero car. I mean, it's two for an airplane that does, you know, 170, 180 knots. Um, so over time, when we get more data, we'll be looking, but it costs expensive. So I'll talk to Craig. This is what we got. Charlie Spinelli had a two blade prop on his airplane. When I pulled up, I joined up on him that morning, and look at this thing just going, whoop. Ooh, it was cool looking. You could almost see it spin. It was huge. I don't know what the diameter it was, but one nice thing about this one is that three blades not going to ever get blown with each beaver tail if you want up on it. It's not going to spell you, which hopefully it won't. Uh, but according to Ron, that's okay. Because if you look underneath, there's these little dorsal things that have a little overstate wheel looking thing on there. So if you land with the nose gear down and up on the nose, nothing really happens to the airplane. You said you did 10 dollars. <laughs> um, yeah, if any of your track players is going to be there one day, but uh, we, we opted to not take that risk here on this on this flight. Trust me, I would really like to raise the gear to go home because we're trucking along at what 105 or something. You know? Oh, oh okay. I wish. <laughs> you wish. 90 is yeah, so a 101. The big ones like this and the long easy like this one. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, ma'am. Another point of interest, you know, very big long easy swap ends somewhere during the nose lift cycle uh, from FTCG. Yeah. I saw that one picture was on the scale with you guys. Yeah. How does this one swap in? Um, it's, it's exactly the same. It depends on how it's loaded, but it's pretty wide open the nose. And, and in the bigger newsletter, Bert addressed that. And he said at first they were always tying it down and making it sit like an airplane. And they finally decided no. And they considered a point of pride to park like that. Honestly, the reason we didn't let it sit on its tail, I would have spent, I wouldn't have a voice today trying to explain to people why it's sitting on its tail. So, but unlike the very easy long easy, if you sit on your tail, you may have burned your rudders. We don't hurt nothing. We're just sitting on those little roller skate wheels, you know. So it, it, it's kind of designed to do that. And Bert said it sits okay in high winds that way too. You wouldn't think so. But uh, we often to just tie it down like that just so that people would, you know. Ask us a million questions. So, yes, sir. Broussard, uh, congratulations on getting it signed off. Was that that was the first DPE sign off? Like you, you showed the earlier uh, zero time. Yeah. Yeah. So it had never been. Yeah. Uh, it, it had never had airworthiness before. Never had airworthiness before. Uh, Eric Madison, when he sold it, the airline was not done. And Tim Thomas finished they were on us, and then they, they were, he said they were pretty young pilots at the time, and a bunch of people talked them out of trying to fly it, and so they parted it out, and, and it never got an airway to stick it to it. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, on the rest of the future, are you going to keep it like 
I would like to keep Lady by exactly how she is. Uh, one of our principles is we strive to keep the airplanes that are coming in dust the way the builder built them. Um, there's no, we're not trying to get more speed out of them, we're not racing. These airplanes represent the builder's achievement. And in this case, this is the way we got Lady by, this is the way it was intended to be. Um, there's four buildings in, in Cuddington. One of Roberts has no wings, the other one has SP wings. So we're hoping that we get one of the SP wing flying airplanes in you know, get another day to fly. He's fired up to get one of his going now, too. So. Wouldn't the four ship of Vegas at Oshkosh be pigeon? Oh, that would be hot. Flight of four Vegas. Yeah. So we don't need all four. We get one of Robert's going on. We'll never finish the winning. I mean, that's just a huge other case. I, I like the idea that maybe one day when we actually do have the Bourbon County Museum, you could have Woody sitting there, you know, a skeleton of a Vegas next to another one on this place. You can see how they're made, you know. Uh, I got asked a bunch this week, why weren't more of them built? This is my opinion. If you think about the timeline, 72, Bert, Bert said when he got here in that video, he says he really hadn't thought about selling the plant when he showed up in 72, and he got such an overwhelming response. He went home and started drafting the plant and selling <coughs> A few years later, the very easy came out. Okay? The, the, the universe is very easy is 75. The 50th anniversary of the very easy is coming up. Okay, we got to do something for that. So I imagine some of these very big builders went, "Why am I building this thing when I can get that and a lot cheaper, go faster, easier to build instead of trying to build a grand piano over here?" You know. So I would say that the very easy got its name because the very big is very hard. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I've never looked out there and you see the lady and it's not the design but in the name. So, cool. I do remember though, in some of the early... Candy's your only one to do the five for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. No, but uh, some, uh, some of the hefty guys were asking about flying very easy and Bert recommended the digging to the big guys. Yeah. Well, I know a guy, that, I think he weighs about 320. The shoe horns and stuff and it was very easy and it was. All it takes is grease on the yeah, Well, Craig, the guy that owns the airplane that races for Rio, he flies that gas at yeah. least 340. And people say, Craig, you fit in that thing? He goes, nope, they get in it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's what, what makes you happy. Okay, like you said, the bosley cockpit is free for overnight. Yes. Right? They do. Well, that one is good. Okay. okay. Yes, Joe. You guys, uh, you guys at the, the jet company, you know parts for bunnies and stuff. <laughs> Um, it's, jet, it's not a jet company. Jet Guys, I refer to that. Jet Guys is Robert Harris's business. It used to be an easy hangar, and then when you did Cozy Jet, they renamed it to you know, Easy Jets. He's always had a connection, and his shop has always been an easy repair station. Um, and, but when he got into the jet stuff, and then he got divorced, he changed the name from Easy Jets to Jet Guys. His work was it's a really the jet guys is just a group of guys that wanted to build jets for themselves. We're not trying to build planes, we're not trying to sell kits. Um, and, and that's a whole different other subject. You got to contact me later. But what what we do down here is really we have way out there. The jet that John Albright is flying, we have the 320 knots. It's way it's, it's like a little FAP because this is really, really cool. What but, is it? What what kind of jet is it? It, it's a one-off design that was built by, designed by Robert Harris, and you couldn't build another one because there isn't one single drawing for there. I'll show it to you later. But, you know. Cool. I, this is a little off the Bertan topic, but uh, those questions are twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead. Well, I, I want to ask you more about jet guys because I know a couple of Eclipse airframes that were never upgraded. But there's nothing wrong with the airframe, and I, I know of one helio courier out in uh, Salt Lake City, a Bountiful. You guys might have seen it here a few years ago. They put an F4 nose gear on this old uh, former tail dragger, and it also had a uh, like a uh, diesel locomotive engine horn on it that they would on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. But, but that was a certified airplane that was later rebuilt and passed. Okay. I think they said you have to do 50, you have to have 50 specific mods to the original 
certified designer, I can come up with about 43 right away. Right. We'll talk later. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, one thing, Richard. Yeah. Just one thing to add, if anybody is more interested, there's a great video on YouTube that Bert did how many years ago for the AMA, about an eight minute video, and specifically about the Viggen. Oh, yeah. It shows the, the, the picture of his, his car, wind tunnel. Yeah. It talks about how it was used in the movie Death Race 2000. It's hilarious to hear him talk about it, how who they wanted to fly it, he wouldn't let that guy fly it, so he finally did the flight scenes for it. But just yeah. going a little more info, it's a really good video to watch. There's a lot of good videos yeah. on the video, so. Yes, our, our plans are regular control. Yes, they are. Yeah. I don't know what to say. I need to go back, too. So. Okay. Any other questions besides cash? <laughs> yes. My understanding is the, the very, very first Cirrus design, they had the engine on the back, right? The VK30. Yeah. The VK30, yeah. right? Yeah. And Cirrus has been a great success, but for some reason they decided the problem in front. Well, because they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 because here, you know, it's like, it's because it's, it's, this is my own personal opinion, okay? I love Dick Van Grissom, great guy, he's a friend, okay? But Dick broke the code on how to bring a product to a market that appeals to a broad spectrum of people. RVs are great airplanes to me, Nothing great about an RV. It's pretty good average airplane, conventional. I call them the Chevrolets and Humboldts, okay? But everybody loves them because of that, okay? When you start putting engines on the back, when you start putting canards out there, and you start defining convention, you're, you're limiting your demographics because not everybody is going to gravitate to that. That's the way I've always kind of assessed it. We are a special breed of people. Okay. Listen, be proud of you. Have to run the <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, listen, we can talk about this all day. I'm having a ball. And I'm not up here in the sun. I'm talking to you and losing my voice. Uh, but, and, and one of the things that I hope to do with this much power in this airplane is I get more experience in it. You know, we have the, the, the Canard Flight Academy down here in Covington where we train people to fly. Uh, canards or the speed canards to certify airplane, we can do that. We can't rent the baby because it's experimental. But if you come through the speed, if you come through the canard flight academy, I see it an additional syllabus for people to get front seat time in the baby with me in the back. There's no controls back there, okay? But give me some time to get things worked out, get your gear working, all that stuff. I, I think with that much power, it would be a good, good platform, you know, somebody gets me a big hole, I get myself out. But everybody, who in this room would not want to fly big? Anybody? No? Everybody would, would love to fly this thing. So why not do that? And so we're kind of we're, we're drifting that way. I would like to see that happen. We're the only place in the world. Routine aircraft flying experience is the only place in the world where you can go fly a long easy thing. It's not yours, okay? Uh, you come through the car, car flight academy, we push you to the speaking hour, we get when you're proficient in that, you can let you give you differences in training, we put you in our long easy, and off you go when your first flight is solo, because I'm not going to be in the backseat scared to death with you, okay? Um, but no, nowhere else you can do that. I always say there's three ways to get into a long easy, or, you know, one of all the way, it's the three. I call them three beats build, borrow, or buy. Which is the hardest of those three? Build, borrow. Yeah. Who's going to lend you your home building? We will. We're going to ask you to make a donation too because we can't rent it, but we we'll, can accept donations. Okay? So you come to Tennessee, go through our car flight academy, you will maybe do well enough, but you will come to you. You fly home with it. Well, now you don't fly too. Who do you have a home here? We have to find the put people in the find. So that's kind of the how you preserve the most by growing the population of people that fly in these airplanes. See, Canard Owner Builder Association, great group of people, you know, follow on the Central States Association and their newsletter and everything that Terry Schubert built. I always say those people are inwardly focused. They're focused on the people that already have airplanes. Their newsletter is all about technical stuff and flying. We are outwardly focused. We're looking for new people to come out here and become part of the marathon.
Go get your friends. Have them come out. The new shirt has a QR code right there. You can probably get that donate money to us. So, yeah. Anybody else we've brought on for a long time? We get about to get kicked out of here. Huh? 945. 945, okay. All right, I'll be at the meeting all day. Yes, sir. Can we get the shirt here? The shirt on your back. The shirt. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we have shirts. They're in charge. Uh, you can't get these. You got to be special to get these. Uh, these are the sponsors and officers and all that stuff and people that give us money. Uh, but uh, no, uh, no, we do have the shirts. We'll be out, we'll be out the day and we'll have all the shirts there. And we'll hand this over to the next uh, venue if there is one. So, all right, and you're going to put this on YouTube? Cool. All right. Anybody that missed it, you can, they can get fall asleep watching me talk on YouTube now. So, well, thank you very much. Instead of taking pictures, can you just um, tell me what your name is? Excuse me. Oh, what, what's your name? Oh, I'm Sierra with the OPA. Very good. And what equipment are you using? Run, do, do a 30 second rundown. Um, this is a Sony FS5 and a, uh, a Sackler video, I don't know the product right? number on it. But, Mike? Uh, the mic is a Rode NT2 and Very the good. lens is a... I forget what this one is that I have on it. Yeah, it's Sony 18 through 110 uh, Cinema Zoom. Very good. And it's Manfrotto? Uh, no, it's uh, Sackler. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what the, what the number is. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Absolutely. That's easier.